welcome to another exciting TIES webinar. My name is Kenny Coogan and I'm a TIES associate. And we're really excited to have Elliot Treffer here today talking about his new book. But first I wanted to let you know about TIES. TIES stands for the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. We're teachers, for teachers, all of our resources are free. You can visit our website, tieseducation.org. We're also active on Twitter and Facebook, and we have a brand new YouTube channel where we archive our webinars, but we also make playlists for teachers. Our focus is middle school teachers. That's how we started, but now we've branched out to elementary and high school. So we have resources for K through 12 on there. Uh, we have animation, real people, Lots of great resources on the YouTube page. We're also looking for some tips. So if you are a teacher and if you taught for one year or if you have taught for 20 years, if you have experience with the following three things, we want you to share with us. We're not looking for more examples on artificial selection, natural selection, uh, things that are like in the textbook, what we're looking for is how do you address common evolution misconceptions? How do you address the phrase, evolution is just a theory? And how do you make children comfortable who are told that evolution is against the religion? So if you have an idea or if you have a tip for one of these three things, you can submit it at tieseducation.org slash tips. We're just looking for a three to six minute video and then we can create this extensive free library because that's what Ties is about. And if we use your tip, I will send you a free Ties t-shirt, just like the one I'm wearing. All right, so I mentioned all of our resources are free. We have labs, we have PowerPoints, we have printables, everything's free except for our book because we just printed it and we have to ship it to you and we have to pay the publisher to print our book. And this book has many chapters, all from science teachers, about how they implement our lessons into, the, um, into their classroom, how they weave it into the whole year. Look, chapter four, familiar face. I wrote chapter four. The cool thing about this book is that there's QR codes. So you can use your phone, click on that. Or if you go to our website, you can see all of our resources that are mentioned in the book and you can just start implementing them. The foreword was written by Richard Dawkins. Part of the Center for Inquiry is uh, TIES, where the education arm, but we have two other arms under the education umbrella. One is Young Skeptics, where we promote inquiry-based learning, so you can go visit that website. And we also have Science Saves, because recently science has been under attack and we want to promote that science is a valuable part of all of our lives. And something nice about Science Saves is that it's not just for science teachers. We have elementary lessons, we have language arts, we have history, we have a math lesson, and uh, we paired them up with your standards. It's all in uh, PowerPoint or Word, which means you can edit it, you can add your name to it. We encourage you to do that, make it your own. We also have a scholarship every May. This year, the deadline is May 8th, and I don't even know if Bertha knows that is my birthday. So the deadline to, for a high school senior to win one of three scholarships is May 8th. All they have to do is make a tiny video, like a 30 second to a 60 second video about how science has improved their lives. And the first place winner uh, gets a lot of money and they can use that for anything. They can use it for tuition, they can use it for traveling to their college, they can use it for um, room and board. All right, so now we're going to have Elliot Treffer. He's gonna be talking about his new book, Queer Ducks. I listened to the uh, audio version, Bertha read it, we both loved it. I first met Elliot through the TV on The Daily Show and then I interviewed him for a magazine and then I said, this would be perfect to be part of the TIES uh, webinar. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this talk and getting to meet all of you here. 
Um, I my favorite moments around this book and this research into same sex sexual behavior in animals. My favorite moments has been having conversations, like hearing what is important to you, what's interesting to you, what you want to learn more about. So I am definitely going to tell you about the research that I did for the book and what I uncovered. Um, I'll give you some front loaded material, but then I am very excited to open it up for a conversation here. What's on your mind? Because this is something that is both surprising scientifically for most of us and also kind of emotionally potent, right? Because it, it, it um, reaches a lot of norms that we assumed around uh, how animals behave and how animal sex works. So um, I'm very looking, very much looking forward to having the conversation. But as you were giving your presentation, Kenny, I was thinking um, when I was in middle school, you know, I grew up in a family of atheists and we didn't have religion. And I had a feeling in middle school, especially, it hit me really hard, this feeling of that everything is arbitrary, like that there is no reason that we do anything we do. Like, why does anyone shake hands? Like, why are we rooting for our team to beat the other team when they're both just teams that would lose and feel sad if they lost? And um, it was hard for me to find, like, why does anything matter? Um, and as a nerd, which won't be a surprise to anyone, I went to the local library and I, I just went, like, looking down the shelves, like, looking for meaning, basically. And I found a book called Thread of Life. It's a Smithsonian book about evolution. And I sat down there right on the industrial carpet in this library and I read that book um, front to end. And evolution like gave me meaning. It was like, gave me a reason that I existed, like why every living thing exists. Like there is a series of events that brought it and a, a sense of, even, even though there's not an intelligence behind it, that there was a causality and a purpose. Um, and it really helped me uh, find, find myself. So anyway, it's extra meaningful to be talking to all of you in this context tonight. Uh, with no further ado, I will share my screen. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to, I'll tell you my plan for our talk tonight, just so you know the lay of the land here. Um, I just want to like give a basic rundown of the state of the field, like where the research is around same-sex sexual behavior in animals and animals that cross sexual binaries. Um, and first, to do that, I just want to answer this basic question of why same-sex sexual behavior persists over time and across the animal kingdom. So we'll start there. Um, I'm going to look through six emblematic species that kind of cross um, vertebrate, invertebrate lines, aquatic land animals, just to see how same-sex sexual behavior operates in, in six animal species. And then I'll answer your questions. Um, so the state of the field. So I'm part of the animal studies program at New York University. And, you know, I'm a gay man. And so I was primed to hear stories of same-sex sexual behavior because I have a vested interest in it as a, as a participant within the human community. Um, but I was really skeptical at the same time because I came from a background of studying evolutionary biology. And it, it always told me that any behavior that didn't bring about more offspring for the next generation wouldn't be selected for, right? And anytime an animal is having sex with an animal of the same sex, it is limiting their reproduction in that moment. And so uh, my whole assumption was that it was some sort of evolutionary dead end, that it might happen for kind of strange reasons in strange places, but it, was, it wouldn't be prevalent within the field. And we had a number of scholars come through the program talking about their research. And these were mainly biologists and zoologists talking about their animal study. And we had a few in a row that mentioned significant same-sex sexual behavior in their animal study. And so it raised this question in my mind of why is this prevalent and where can I find out more? Um, and I found some kind of dense, older academic works um, on it. But it was hard for me to find a sort of public facing work that would kind of give a lay of the land and why this was happening. And so I had that sinking feeling inside that of like, oh no, it means I have to write it. <laughs> um, I am, I'm a, come from a background of writing young adult uh, fiction mainly. Uh, my last book before Queer Ducks was called The Darkness Outside as the YA sci fi story. Um, but I realized, like, oh, I'll, I'll dive in and do this research. I also happened to be when the pandemic was starting. So I was basically stuck in uh, like a little room of my house and I just dived in and saw what was there. And what I found was that the Nature just did a study pretty recently that did a kind of survey of the field and found that there are 1,500 different animal species with significant same-sex sexual behavior in the wild, 1500. And this is, um, you know, really peer-reviewed peer, uh, and heavily researched uh, studies. And there's been a lot of work around possible reasons why. Um, and I'm, when we look at these six animal species I'm about to talk about, you'll find a slightly different reasons in each case. Um, but one of the most compelling ones I came across was a recent article by some young scientists um, who basically realized that we are, we are in a cultural moment where we kind of 
over ascribe homosexuality and heterosexuality to other humans, right? We're sort of one or the other, and we kind of skip over or, or have a tendency to neglect thinking about bisexuality. Animals don't have that same prohibition. So and for an animal to have occasional sexual acts with a member of the same sex, um, if they're still reproducing, it doesn't have a great cost. It's not like the, the dead end theory. It's just um, a, a, an event that doesn't produce offspring in that moment. And that might have other benefits. And we'll see with these animals, the reasons that they are having uh, significant same-sex sexual behavior uh, in the wild. So basically, why does it persist? It isn't costly when you actually think that it is not, for most of these animals, the sole behavior. They're occasional, exclusively homosexual animals, but it is unusual. These are mostly bisexual animals we'll be talking about. It isn't costly and it has benefits. And so let's talk about what those benefits might be. Um, and I think it's probably easiest to start by talking about the bonobos. Um, a, because they are super charismatic. You just start with the one that like has the adorable stuffed animals for it. This, this is a particularly adorable bonobo. I actually did um, research on them at the sanctuary for bonobos, Lola Ya Bonobo in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I met some ugly bonobos, they do exist, but this is, this is a really cute one on your screen. Um, but this animal shares 98.7% of its DNA with Homo sapiens. Um, so an incredible overlap. And depending on who's doing the math, they are tied with chimpanzees as our closest relatives. Uh, but unlike chimps, which have this largely patriarchal, violent society, bonobos have a much, much more peaceful society. There's no recorded instances of bonobos killing each other, um, and they have a matriarchy, so the females are in charge. And mostly, this, these are also mothers. So when you have mothers in charge of the group, they have a really vested interest in and their offspring not getting hurt. Uh, and so for a long time, we knew that, that this matriarchy kind of forged this more Pacific society that they have. However, this matriarchy, when we started really diving in and studying bonobos in the 80s, we find the matriarchy is really based on a sexual connection between these females. So the most common sexual activity among bonobos is female-female. Um, and I definitely saw how common it was when I was at this uh, sanctuary in Congo. Um, and what happens when sex happens um, is oxytocin is released, known as the bonding hormone, um, and it produces a, a feeling of intense closeness between whichever two parties are having, uh, having sex. And so the females have this really, really close connection through their very frequent sexual activity that allows them to form these really strong alliances and keep male aggression at bay. So this frequent sexual activity among females produces this coherent matriarchy uh, within the group. And so they're mostly also having um, sex with males. So they're ha still having offspring. Um, and, but as we know with humans, there's many motives for having sex, right? There's only one of which is procreation. Uh, and for animals, for a long time, we've, we've not thought about them in that way, that they could have multiple motives and multiple advantages and adaptive strategies for their sexual activity. Uh, and so the bonobos are a really um, square on uh, compelling counterexample uh, against this sort of heterosexual only assumption that we had around, around animals. Um, this is just one of the bonobos I met in Congo. I just have to show him, he's Oshwe. Um, and I took my little flip video camera and I took a video of him and showed him the video of himself. And he was like, that is so cool. Who is this handsome young, young ape that I'm seeing on the screen? <laughs> really into it. Um, but after the bonobos, on the, uh, on the flip side, we have the bottlenose dolphins. Um, and so if bonobos turn to female sexual activity as a bonding strategy, the bottlenose dolphins do the same thing on the male side. Uh, so Janet Mann has pretty much the, the longest standing dolphin research site in Shark Bay, Australia. Uh, and for a long time, the research talked about how male friendship is the structuring element of dolphin society. Um, and it wasn't until the taboos against publishing against same-sex sexual behavior um, started to erode that we finally had the, the revelation of what the, what the source is of this male friendship is, and it's a, it's a very sexual friendship. They are far more sexual than even the bonobos. Uh, so bottom those dolphin male pairs will have sex on average about 2.4 times an hour. Um, and I just did a school visit on Friday and the first question from one of the students was like, how do you have 0.4 sex acts? Oh, I just explained that that doesn't mean that they like, you know, just have a 0.4 uh, amount of sex, but they have like say 24 sex acts over 10 hours and then she, and she got it. 
Um, but so these males are incredibly bonded through this frequently sex, frequent sexual activity, this oxytocin rush that it provides. Uh, and it's actually the only longstanding social unit within bottlenose dolphin society is between these two males, this, this, these sexually bonded males. They'll invite a female into their partnership for a few weeks uh, and they will mate with her, one or both will mate with her. And then she will go on her way to raise her calf by herself or with uh, other females. And these males are bonded for life and will go off uh, and kind of rule the seas together. Sometimes these dolphin male pairs, sometimes it's a thruple, but these small units of male dolphins will join up with other groups to, to seize territory and to compete for the most desirable uh, females. Um, but it's really the, the only lifelong unit because the mothers and calves will separate once the calf is raised. So this only lifelong unit within the dolphin society is these sexually bonded males. Um, and so there was a joke in that TV show Glee that said, uh, did you know that dolphins are just gay sharks? Um, and I laughed when it was on back in 2004. And then I did my research and I was like, uh, it's kind of sort of <laughs> dolphins are like, are a pretty, pretty gay animal, actually, um, if you want to get right down to it. Um, oh, I just skipped from three to four. That's just my PowerPoint numbering. Don't worry. This is the animal I meant to talk about next. Um, but while, while we're on the topic of sea creatures, um, something I, I wanted to do in Queer Ducks was approach not just same-sex sexual behavior in animals, but the ways in which animals blur this assumption we have that sex is something definite and permanent and that uh, gender is maybe more amorphous and, and can change over someone's life. Um, but animals do plenty to complicate the boundary between male and female. Um, and you know, if the, if the fish had a pride flag, it would take hours to color it in. Like there are so many sexual identities when you consider that um, fish will, some will be born female and stay female, some will be born female and turn male, some will be born male and turn female, some will be born male and turn male, some will be born male, turn female, go back to being male. Um, and so you have this wide range of behaviors. Um, and, you know, there's a, a large percentage of hermaphroditism in, in aquatic animals. Um, and so you have, my favorite are marine snails, which are all born male, and then the two males will meet and they'll wait for one of them to turn female and then they start having sex and they have offspring. And my favorite thing about the marine snails is that the, um, some males actually show a preference for other males or other females. So, you know, we tend to not really think of even fish as having like individualized preferences. And here are these marine snails, these invertebrate marine snails um, that also like some of them just like other males or like other females and um, have their choices once they pick a, someone who's already transitioned or who has not yet transitioned. Um, but the, uh, the Blue Street Cleaner Wrasse is, a, is an aquarium fish for a lot of people. You, someone might have it in their home right now. Um, it's a coral living fish. Um, and in their society, it's epic. Like I feel like, you know, you could have a great um, supernatural movie about the life of these warrior fish. I mean, they have epic lives. So they live within one small part of the coral. Um, and it's a group of female fish uh, with one male who's kind of in charge. Um, and he stays in charge through what they call social domination, which looks to my eyes just like bullying, basically. He nips them if they ever act out of order and, and keeps them all in this little part of coral, like in his little fiefdom. Um, but while he's defending this section of coral from other males, the females go out and will um, clean the teeth of these giant, giant groupers or moray eels. Um, and they do a kind of a, a dance. And then once it's acknowledged in both parties that he's not gonna try to eat her, um, she'll go in and start cleaning the gills and the teeth of this much larger fish. Um, and so after the, the females have gone and cleaned these monsters' teeth, um, they come back and then they come back to the coral. Um, but what is really interesting is if that male um, that's in charge, either it dies naturally or he challenges another male and he dies. Um, the females for two hours, peace reigns and no, there's no, the bully is gone. Um, and then whichever female is top of their hierarchy will turn male within those two hours and become that bully dominating the other females. Uh, and so you always have this one male fish, but all the females have the capacity to become that one male uh, if, the, if the social conditions are right. Um, and it's a really fascinating behavior. Um, and 
some fish it goes the other direction. So pound fish, for example, um, it's the it's the opposite. You would have only just one female in charge. I'm about to spoil Finding Nemo, so pause the video if someone in your room hasn't seen Finding Nemo. But that movie's been out for a long time, so I don't feel so bad. But um, Nemo's is a clownfish, and his mother dies. So his father, Marlin, should have become his mother, should have changed into being female, which I think would make for a much more interesting movie. And I would pay good money for that, that version of Finding Nemo if, um, if Pixar ever wanted to make it. Um, and I often get the question of, uh, you know, is there, is there an analog to trans identity in animals? Um, and that is a question that we kind of have to leave unresolved um, because so much of trans identity in humans is someone's ability to express their internal relationship, their mental relationship with their own externally visible um, sex. So that you can say like, I know you're reading me as female or male, but I, I, I am uh, he, she, or they, I have a different um, sex, uh, gender identity, what you, what you think I am. Um, and obviously an animal can't tell us that. So we, we have to kind of leave the trans question at the door, but there are many animals who are intersex um, and not just isolated individuals, but significant proportions of the population that um, exist outside of the male female binary. Um, and I think my favorite example is the velvet horn deer um, and white tailed deer, which are most common North American deer, they're known as velvet horns. Um, they're known as uh, cactus bucks among mule deer. And most um, bovids have some version of this animal. Um, so a velvet horned deer, um, so male deer will grow their antlers and they're covered with velvet, as you see on the screen, um, in their early, early life. And then they break their velvet and you see the shiny antlers we're, we're more used to. And then it's the males join an all male herd, having frequent male male sexual activity, by the way, um, <laughs> join this male male herd. And then they uh, compete for females using those antlers. But 13% of white-tailed deer are velvet horns. Um, they have the body type of does, um, and they, but they grow antlers. And the antlers never break their velvet, so they stay in this younger stage. Um, because they don't fit into this highly sex-segregated deer society, um, they are kind of rejected from the male herd and the female herd um, and live on their own, unless they find other white-tailed uh, velvet horned deer uh, in which case they form this kind of found family together of other velvet horns and form their own community. And there's even been cases where these small velvet horn groups will adopt uh, orphaned deer uh, that don't have a parent otherwise. Uh, and so it's this striking animal that, that, that really does exist between the boundaries. Um, another group that has um, significant amounts of intersexuality is cetaceans uh, in whales. You find many with with both sets of genitalia. And that's putting to one side the animals who are 100% um, hermaphrodites of one way or another. So for example, um, flatworms um, have the capacity to have be male and female at the same time. And when two flatworms meet, it's like a, a duel at high noon. And you know they're, they have these soft edges and they just form these penises instantly and try to jab each other. And whichever one jabs the other one first, will inject what's called an allo hormone that changes the internal state of the other flatworm so it becomes 100% female. Um, and at that point, she now has the burden of raising these fertilized eggs and the other uh, still hermaphroditic flatworm that won that duel can go off and, and you know impregnate some other flatworm where now she has to raise these thousands of little flatworm eggs. So again, the, the sea life still has those beat as far as the diversity of their sexual expression. Um, and the one thing I wanted to talk about was fruit flies. And so I went from super charismatic to uh, highly uncharismatic, um, the fruit flies. And I'm sorry if there's any fruit fly fans in the, in the room, you can, you can talk to me later. But um, fruit flies I found really interesting because in the 90s, I think the 90s, mid 90s, which is when I was uh, a teenager, was the last moment where we had this similar anxiety around LGBTQIA plus people and, and identities, um, that it was as much at a fever pitch then, and maybe even stronger. Um, you know, so in 95, that was when Ellen DeGeneres came out in her sitcom and it was canceled soon after. Uh, RuPaul had a talk show that was making all sorts of men who thought they were 100% straight really confused about 
whether they actually were. Um, and then under the Bush administration, uh, you also had this movement towards, you know, focusing on the family and Newt Gingrich and this um, prohibition against any studies of sexuality in humans. So there, there was uh, a, a huge amount of AIDS research happening that got distilled by that administration. Um, however, there was um, studies in the agriculture department into homosexuality in sheep and cattle because that was very costly for farmers, and that still continued. Um, so that was still that was still funded because uh, a, like a prize steer costs six thousand dollars, but if he's only interested in other males, then it's it's difficult for the um, for the farmer to get him to impregnate females. Um, right in the middle of this uh, was a study that the gay gene had been discovered uh, in fruit flies, um, and the scientists um, who published on this study um, called the gene fruitless, which is sort of funny but also sort of awful. But they said that once this gene was uh, tweaked, um, that they could turn a male, male fruit fly so that it only had desire for other, other males. And there was this incredible video of uh, like thousands of male fruit flies, uh, basically in a conga line. They, they engage in um, genital licking, which is just what it sounds like, um, as their portrait ritual. And so they were all in a vast line uh, genital licking together. Um, and so it was, it, it was, everyone, you know, Time and Newsweek, they cover stories on it. It was that we'd finally discovered the genetic basis for, for gayness. Um, and that was actually not really true. So what the scientists had done is they had removed the fruit fly's ability to discriminate the sex of other fruit flies. And so by putting a bunch of males in one, in one group, they, they did all have sex. It sort of appeared like an all male sex group, but they would have had sex with females as well. They just were no longer discriminating the sex of other fruit flies. So the science was, was not the, you know, foundational grand slam that everyone, that the scientists hoped it was, which ultimately I think, personally, I think is, is good news for LGBTQIA plus people, because if you can have a genetic basis for sexuality, then you can also have tests for it. Um, all of us who have given our DNA to 23andMe and gotten our cool genome that tells us how, what percentage of us is Neanderthal, you know, you could imagine some candidate running, running for office saying like, oh, well, we'll look in these databases and find out who the known homosexuals are um, and pass laws or worse against them. Uh, and so I use the chapter on fruit flies as a way of looking into like the genetic basis for sexuality. Um, and ultimately our best way of studying it is through identical twin studies. Um, so if identical twins are separated at birth and raised in different households, you can tell from the, the correspondence and it, whether they're both um, of the same sexuality or not, you can tell how much of a genetic basis there might be towards sexuality. Uh, and so basically the, the putting all that research together is sexuality is sort of genetic. It's like between like 50 and 60% genetic, um, which I think is kind of the actual best news that, that, that we could want as LGBTQIA people. Uh, but if people have different takes, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on it. Um, so those are the six emblematic speeches. Then they're talking about 10 in Queer Ducks, but um, you know, and there's 1,500 total. So I thought when I began the book that it would be, I'd have to really kind of search for this niche, niche research. Instead, it very quickly turned to like, oh no, like I, I can't possibly cover all of this. So how am I gonna drill down and, and pick which animals to, um, to, to look at? Um, well, one last one. This is actually number six. I just screwed up my number. <laughs> my PowerPoint skills are pretty basic. So if you have any uh, kids in your class who can do a really good PowerPoint, um, let me know and I can send them my file and they can fix it for me. Um, but the Japanese macaque monkeys is what I'll finish on for the presentation part of this. Are we doing that time? Okay. Um, for the presentation part, because they kind of um, muddy any simple explanations we have for why same-sex sexual behavior persists in, within animal species. Um, and they're kind of my favorite example, not just because they have these rad lives where they live in these hot baths in the snow in Northern Japan. I mean, it looks really awesome, um, but it is actually really competitive to get the great spots in these hot baths. So their hierarchy is very important to them even more than for most macaques. Um, and it's been known for decades that Japanese macaques have a high 
incidence rate of female-female sex within their group, so just like the bonobos do. Um, and Paul Vasey, a primatologist, studied a population of Japanese macaque monkeys for decades. Um, and he basically tested out all the theories that have helped explain same-sex sexual behavior in other animals. He tested them on the Japanese macaques uh, and to see whether they held true or not. Uh, so some of those theories are like what we said before. So like alliance formation or um, primatologists that thought maybe these macaque monkeys were, were the females were bartering for parental care with other females. So by having sex together, they're basically getting a, a bonded partner to help raise offspring. Um, my favorite theory was that the uh, that the female macaque monkeys were staging sexual encounters to excite males, and that one just that one just cracked me up. I was like, "Yeah, you wish, guys. Like, this is what happens when you have all male primatologists like coming up with theories for why these females are having sex." Um, and he basically found ultimately that none of those held. So the prediction that each of those theories would would give us, for example, with the staging sexual encounters. You would then predict that they would do it only in front of other males, that they would then have sex with males afterwards, and those were just not true. The males were often kind of just like playing with a leaf and totally ignored um, before and after this, this sex. So none of them actually held through when tested. Um, and so it came at the end with the most simple explanation, which was also like surprisingly controversial when we talk about animals, which so often we think of them as these cogs for evolution, right, that they are um, a accumulation of adaptions, um, adaptations, and that they are doing what is best to get more offspring. Um, his ultimate conclusion was that these females are having sex with each other because they want to. Like, and that was that was it. Like, full stop. Um, and you know, his his explanation is that we evolved sexual reproductive organs for the purpose of procreation, which comes from heterosexual union of animals. Like, no one's doubting that. But these Japanese macaque monkeys, once they have these sexual organs and two females have the ability to experience pleasure together and to, to feel a sense of closeness through it, that they just do it because they want to and it feels good and what's stopping them. Um, and it's um, surprisingly controversial for the old school um, evolutionary biologists who, who don't like the mentalistic explanations for why an animal would do something, right? That it's this got a mind, and because it has a mind, the mind tells it that it could do this thing. Um, but I kind of, I kind of love it because it keeps this sort of unknowability about the ways that animals behave, and the, that you you can't reduce it to easy explanations in all cases. Sometimes you can, but um, most often you cannot. Um, so. Let's talk. I, I would love to open it up for questions that came up in the chat. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat, um, but I am happy to to answer any. Um, and I don't know if anyone has questions already, but bring it on. Let's, let's talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Elia. So um, if you guys have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. I just linked, if you're attending this webinar live, I just linked. Um, Queer Ducks, and then I also linked the Ties book. Um, Ellen had a question referring to the Science Saves uh, scholarship. She wanted to know if people, students in New York could apply for that scholarship. And yes, absolutely. All 50 states are eligible. You just need to be a senior. Um, I also had so I listened to your audiobook, and one thing that I shared with everyone was how bonobos and chimps uh, dissimilarly resolve peanut butter in their group. Do you want to tell that story real fast as we get a couple of questions lined sure. up? Um, yeah, before I forget, if you're interested in talking about um, this field with your students and a book is too much to assign or have them read, um, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post magazine in July. Um, it's called Queer Animals Are Everywhere. Um, and it's basically a, a summary of the current state of the research in this field um, in a 2,000 word form instead of a 60,000 word form. So um, you can find that online at, on Washington Post. Queer, it's called Queer Animals Are, are Everywhere. Um, we have the chimp and the bonobo example is really telling. So this is um, Franz de Waal, who's kind of the foremost primatologist studying bonobos. Um, 
noted in his book about bonobos that they have very different responses to novel foods. So within an animal group, an easy way to see what the hierarchy is, is to give them something that they haven't experienced before and see who manages the situation and how they manage it. So um, uh, apes in particular really love green apples, um, and that is not a, a food native to um, the region of Africa that bonobos and chimps are from. Uh, and so when you give green apples or peanut butter or honey, uh, was an, uh, another part of the study, that if you give that to a group of chimps, the burliest and strongest males will come in, seize the food, um, give it to their allies, and normally the females and young ones are just kind of left out. Um, and however, when you give them a novel food to bonobos, they will all approach this food source, they'll all kind of surround it, and then they'll get very anxious. Um, and they're clearly worried about how this is going to get distributed. And before anyone even touches the food, these bonobos will all just start having an orgy. Like it's just all at once, all together, young and old, male, female, 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 and male, male, every, like the whole, the whole group. And once they're tired and blissed out and just laying there, they'll, one will slowly take some of the food uh, in this like peaceful state and then another one will take some of the food. Uh, and so it's this, this totally alternate version for how to distribute resources. Um, and I'm not sure how far we can take it as far as like what it might mean for human societies, but it is interesting to see this kind of using love as like leading the way with kind of love and connection and then distributing instead of just leading with power like like chimpanzees do. Um, so it's, it's, it's a potent metaphor to think about and to, um, to look at in the two groups. Trevor, Noah had a good response to that. And if you're interested, you can watch Elliot's interview with him of what, what Trevor said regarding the bonobo situation. Um, I had a question about, in the book you mentioned that there was a sheep scientist who was kind of embarrassed that he was noticing all this homosexual behavior. And then later in his autobiography or biography, it came that he was saying that he just loved and endeared sheep so much that he couldn't put that label on them. My question is, how did you find that resource? I assume you can research like homosexuality, you know, in a scientific paper, and then you can say like, oh, people have documented in fruit flies and seals and dolphins. And, but how did you find some of those like hidden gems? Yeah, there was, so that was just, um, you know, just using the NYU libraries and just going, like going into papers, reading them, looking at their citations and going deeper and deeper that way um, and finding when something had been mentioned that was interesting to me. Um, one of the foundational books in my early research was uh, this book called Biological Exuberance by Bruce Bagamiel from 1999, but it's basically a compendium of same-sex sexual behavior as observed in animals with a really, really extensive bibliography. Uh, and so one of the, when he was, he wrote on bighorn sheep in here um, and uh, mentioned Valerius Geist, this sheep researcher. Uh, and so I was able to use that to go to his work. So Valerius Geist studied bighorn sheep in the 60s. Uh, and it was then that he observed that they basically live in a homosexual society. So you have these male herds and female herds like the deer, they're entirely sex segregated. The males have very frequent sex and only come together with the females for the few weeks of the rutting season. But he didn't publish on that um, because as he said, quote, he couldn't conceive of these magnificent beasts as queers. Uh, and so he, he just didn't, he squelched that part of the research. Uh, and it was years later, it's still fairly early on, I think this is in the late seventies, he wrote about how he had taken that, that, that part of their life out of his big book on bighorn sheep and then only put it in years later. Um, so it's just a way in which we, we have, I think when we talk about history, we have come now to, to really talk about history as a story told by those who have power, who survive historical events, right? That it's created by historians and because they're, they're people that they have their own points of view. We don't often think of scientists that way, uh, but I think he's a great example of that it's unavoidable that, that science is made by scientists. And so it, it is going to reflect their worldviews to some extent. And he's a, he's a very um, striking example of, of uh, the cutting of uh, a certain element of their behavior just because of it was out of love. Like he didn't want people, he wanted people to love his sheep and he thought that was an unlovable thing that they were doing, right? Um, but it was very much part of the time and part of, part of his thinking at the time. So Ties is part of the Center for Inquiry. And I think we know the comedian Ricky Gervais. 
In uh, 2019, Ricky Gervais was awarded the Richard Dawkins Award. But on a slightly different note, 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago-ish, Ricky Gervais has an entire stand-up about the biological exuberance, animal ho homosexuality, and he basically like holds the book and he just like goes through it and he kind of riffs about how um, it's natural. And speaking of that, Bertha Vasquez, the Thai's director says, when somebody says gay, it's just not natural, she supposes you can just point to this book and say, here are some natural examples. Yeah. It's been interesting to see in the feedback to the book. I think someone was asking about if I have any issues with book yeah, banning and libraries. And um, it's interesting to see how quickly the, you know, the initial reaction of like, oh, this, this, there can't be that much research. Like you're probably just, like, just cherry picking examples. And then like, just looking at like the bibliographies of like articles in science and nature, you know, not, not like small publications um, that like very quickly turn to like, oh, well, well, we should, we don't want to do everything that animals do, right? Like animals will, eat their own feces. They will cannibalize their sexual partners. Like, are you trying to say we should do that too? Like, what are you trying to say? Um, and it's interesting how it feels like an act of aggression. Like if people have a vested interest in having this sort of sacred Noah's Ark version of like heterosexual partners only, like it does feel like a, an attack or that something's being taken from them. But instead, I think the argument of the book, and it, it's not like, I'm not saying the book doesn't have an argument, but the argument of queer ducks is, that we can no longer say that that it is that LGBTQ humans don't have a referent in the in the animal kingdom that it doesn't exist in nature. I think that is that is intellectually empty to even claim that um, based on all this research. So you can say something else. You can say you know I don't believe in it. I don't like it. But you can't say it's unnatural. Like that just doesn't doesn't hold. And that we're seeing in, from across the animal kingdom, like vertebrates and vertebrates and birds and monkeys and Ish, you know, that it is a significant part across the animal kingdom and had, and it's part of our heritage as animals. Very good. So Tizes, teachers for teachers, and I believe uh, NPR said that your book is like suitable for teenagers, right? So how would you suggest, or would you suggest teachers using portions of your book for middle school, high school, I know that wasn't your real intent, but, or, or do you think it should be at a school, you know, middle school library? Yeah, um, so I'm of two minds because I'm the, Queer Ducks is actually written as a young adult book. It is a, from a young adult publisher. So it is, it is intended to be in school libraries and to be read in class. Um, I also know what strain teachers are on right now based on the culture wars that are happening. And I, I don't, want someone to do something that could get them fired you know um so like, like in florida like in florida yeah exactly yeah um so i understand the that struggle um so i think maybe you know sharing like as a starting place sharing that washington post article you know it's just like a more like it's not just a book it's like a like a major national newspaper it could be a easier way to begin um, but I get it. I get it that we are all trying to be inclusive and be empathetic and that we're also uh, under pressure from unfair forces that are that are pushing all of us really hard. So um, it is, I think it belongs in classrooms, but I also know you have really full units. So um, at least at least it belongs in conversation, I think. And I think for this certain students for whom this message that you are actually not unnatural is a life-saving message. Um, and you might not even know how many of your students that is. Um, Trevor Project did a, study, a survey of youth last year and found that 42% of LGBTQ youth across the country had considered suicide at some point in their lives. Um, and this unnatural messaging that you are, that there's something inherently wrong with you is a big part of that, um, that depression. So uh, just having access to the fact that you think this is cool, right, is, is a start already. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, my favorite examples in the book, I didn't talk about it in our session, was is the albatross. And they have female-female partnerships. Um, the females don't have sex. It's not a sexual partnership. But these females will choose each other, uh, bond for life, will spend most of the year apart, uh, and then come back and, like, 
work their way through the crowd and they're ecstatic when they find each other and they do this great dance with their beats and like do a kind of a dab thing where they put the head on the wing. And these are life partners that are that are females. It's a third of the nests in lace and albatross. Um, and it's just this like, it's, you know, using the word love can make a, like a classically trained biologist pass out on the spot, but it's like, looks like love to me. Like this is a, a life union, even though it's not a sexual one uh, of these two females raising eggs together. So you could maybe share the albatross chapter because <laughs> you're, there's not even any sex, right? <laughs> it just happens to be like a pair of, pair of female birds that are like, she's a much better parent than these males are and she's the one I choose, um, which I think is a nice message too. So just follow up on Patty's question. So your book came out in June, I believe. Did you hear any school libraries banning it full out or is it under the radar? I think so. It's it, the, where, where Queer Ducks has done well, it's with parents and families and kids themselves buying it. Um, I think given the massive ramping up of challenges uh, and, um, and pressure from groups like Moms for Liberty, um, we have far less institutional acquisition of LGBTQ titles across the board. The thing is, you can't ban something, that, you can't remove something from a library that wasn't there in the first place. And so we're actually finding the institutional pickup for a nonfiction book that's YA to be very low. Um, and that's true for all LGBTQ nonfiction that's coming out this year, but um, Queer Dex is included. So um, as far as actual banning and challenges, it has not had the fire that I thought it would have. Um, I mean, I certainly got tons of angry mail from, you know, people accusing me of being a groomer, you know, that like coming after our children, you know, um, and that both feels like it's so not true about who I am that it feels like a playground font, like it's like calling me like third breath or something. But at the same time, I know it's the like, dehumanizing of LGBTQ people that is happening across the board through these, this project uh, of, of, of really just like being much more vocal about being anti-queer, anti um, that, that dehumanizing has real consequences and, and it can be dangerous. So it's been both makes me even more committed to fighting this fight and making these LGBTQ kids that feel alone, not feel alone and not feel unnatural, makes me more committed, but it also makes me realize like um, how much anger and prejudice is, is out there. Um, and I know I know we're all seeing it in our schools and classrooms too. So speaking for myself, if you are a teacher and you're considering getting this book, I would recommend it because as a middle school student myself, I would never ask the teacher or, you know, I wouldn't seek something like this out, but if it was a resource in the classroom, then I would sneakily have read it and learned from it. Yeah. All right, and so Patty wants to know, have you considered writing a children's book version? And I will add that there is a comic for each chapter. There's a little cartoon for each chapter. Yeah, so this is um, a, a youth. The premise is that it's a, uh, yeah, the first. it's like a um, animal GSA, like a gay straight alliance or gender sexuality alliance. And they're all meeting to introducing each other, introducing themselves for each chapter. So like the bonobo takes her turn, you know, and talks about what it's like in her house. Um, so it, it's meant to be approachable to teens and young people. Um, but uh, I think, you know, I did an event with um, Justin Parnell and Peter Richardson who wrote uh, in Tango Makes Three, which is the picture book about um, Roy and Silo, the two penguins at the Central Park Zoo that raised an egg uh, and had a, a little baby bird named Tango. Um, and we did an event together um, and we talked about how basically like I, my first chapter is also about penguins and how penguins have been kind of stirring things up in zoos since long before um, the Central Park Zoo, since the 19 teens in, in Edinburgh. Um, and so we're, we were talking about how like there is kind of continuum of accessible work that, that helps um, sort of open minds about the, all the different ways that there are to love and be both for humans and for, for non-humans. Um, so I think their book is a, is a great kind of ladder uh, up to Queer Ducks and it's a, it's a place to go from one to the next. Do you remember when that was published? I think it was 2006. Yeah. 
And it's been every year, it's been in the top 10 most banned books ever since. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I, I, I read it um, as research for this book and also before we did our event together and I reread it then. And um, it's amazing. They lead with the fact that there's two male penguins is implicit in their name and like the pronouns that, that, they, that are used. But it is really just a story about these two parents who love their chick so much. <laughs> it's just a story of, of, of love and, mean, and, and what a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great story for kids, I think. Um, so, and it's a true story. The Roy and Silo, Silo, the reason these zookeepers gave them an egg to raise was they um they were brooding rocks. So penguins is a way of showing like they're ready to have an egg or they wish they had an egg at the moment. Will like brood any object that is egg shaped and egg sized. And so they were just like sitting on a rock and you know kind of looking at it, waiting for it to hatch. Um, and so that's when they gave them this egg that had been abandoned um, to to raise. Um, but most most recently there was a really great. Uh, news story just like a couple of years ago um, in a Dutch zoo there were a pair of male penguins that stole an egg from a heterosexual couple and raised that egg and then the next year they stole an egg from a, uh, a female female couple of penguins so it's like it was like out of the gossip column this is like this like egg stealing male pair so it's not all good behavior on the penguins parts penguins, penguins will definitely stir it up that's for sure all right. So Patty says she's very thankful for you doing the book and the webinar. We're almost out of time. So if you guys have any more questions, feel free to type them in. But I do have one more question. And it's from somebody who has their master's by studying Japanese macaques. So she wants to know, I'm curious if the studies you referenced considered given the Japanese macaques are strictly hierarchical. Um, that would mean that like any behavior that results in, that would result in significantly reduced stress, especially among females. So do you know if they considered that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, one of the interesting things that one of the, I mean, one, one of the most common explanations for same-sex sexual behavior in animals that comes out is the dominance theory, right? That it's a way of like, oh, they're mounting each other just dominance, like it's like one killing the other, um, which could very well be true in a lot of cases, right? But even when when two humans have sex and dominance is part of why they're doing it, it's still sex, right? It's not like it is no longer sexual behavior because now that it's now it's about dominance. Um, with the macaques, it is possible that it is this part of that good feeling they're getting is just like to, to not feel stressed by the hierarchy. Um, I think that is, I think it's a very reasonable thought. It's a, it's a hard to test one, which is might be why might be why it's the one that would survive this gauntlet of testing these various theories that Paul Basie did. Um, the dominance one didn't hold with them because he often found that they were uh, switching positions, who was mounting and who was mounted, um, that often it was the subservient one who was initiating, and then in another case, it was the dominant one, that it was never, it didn't map onto the hierarchy in any coherent way. So he, he wasn't able to, to attribute it to dominance, but um, it's very possible that if they're doing it because it feels good, Part of that feeling good could be the stress of their their social um, interactions. I think it's a it's a good thought. She adds, "I ask because they're in such like a tyrannical species. They need to reduce stress more because they don't enforce things often. But when they do, when they do, someone loses like a tail or an eye, or it's like really you know graphic and bad. And it would be very useful for macaques to keep things chill even more." So comparing them to like a species like bonobos would be difficult. Yeah, well, honestly, the bonobos like have a pretty strong police force in their matriarchy. So when I was there, you could see a lot of the males had big scars that were missing parts of their fingers. Um, so the, the females will really police male behavior in very aggressive ways. Um, so, and I think, you know, we don't know, we, they don't have the levels of aggression that chimps do in the levels of violence, but, you know, could there be breaks on it because of, their sexual activity, that they're because they're feeling this linkage within the whole group, they, this orgy situation that they often have, and that maybe that's that's stopping them from reaching higher levels of aggression, which um, I think could could make them a parallel to the Japanese macaque monkeys. Well, Elliot, we're out of time, but we appreciate it so much. If you guys want to get in contact with Elliot. Um, do you have a website or social media that they should visit? Yeah, you can reach me on elliotschrafer.com. I'm also on Twitter at Elliot Schrafer. And 
Instagram. Uh, so all the usual places you can find me. I don't, I don't get on Snapchat because I'm too old. I don't understand it. <laughs> Anything up to Instagram. <laughs> right. I'm I ready. too am a geriatric millennial <laughs> and I don't do those either. So thank you everyone for attending this live. It will be posted on uh, the Ties Facebook and YouTube page in maybe a day or two. And uh, thank you so much, Elliot. And everyone else, have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me.